Two weeks ago, I was captivated, like so many of us, by the possibility of observing the northern lights in Southern California. A bucket list experience from the comforts of home? Yes, please. Images of the auroras from that first night illuminated an otherwise dreary day of social media doom scrolling. And I, like much of the world, was taken. So late that second night, we drove into the Angeles National Forest along with the entire population of LA County. <laughs> Our hoped for mystical experience at an otherwise secluded and remote trailhead became a social one, complete with non stop streams of headlights in both directions. The stars still stunned, of course. But none of the marvelous colors made by Earth's magnetic field and that magical merger of energized particles from the sun and our atmosphere. And yet the whole scene moved me quite unexpectedly as each car of people pulled over, excitedly got out, and gazed up in collective wonder. Why are you standing here looking up at the skies? The messengers ask the weary, want, wondering followers of Jesus. Their question is rhetorical, I think, but also hides an invitation. To what? The ascension of Jesus, likely an obscure story to many of us, actually precedes Pentecost, both in the scriptural narrative and in the liturgical calendar. And yet, here we are. The Sunday after a particularly awesome Pentecost, a chapter earlier in the book of Acts talking about ascension. The whole day and the whole story, I, I can imagine Jesus' sandaled feet poking out of a cumulus cloud before he finally disappears. It all may feel as out of place as the northern lights in Southern California or the southern lights in the northern Atacama Desert of Chile. Why are we sitting here looking up at these skies? This story represents a movement's coming to terms with the physical absence of their energizing force and their faith that that one would return. So they watch the horizon, hedging their hopes. Yet in the vacuum of this absence, they discover both their own powerlessness and a power not their own a presence, a higher power of their understanding there all along. What was an ending, stark in its finality, sparks an unexpected beginning. The life-saving 12 steps that we have explored over the past seven weeks of this series echo such wisdom. They say that the beginning of our healing, no matter our compulsions, begins at the end of our illusion of control over life and control over others' actions and our delusion of control over our addictions. A sponsor of one of our community members remarked that the first step of the 12 is the only one you have to get perfectly right. We admitted we were powerless, for without it, the whole process can't take off. It should be revisited repeatedly in recovery or whatever our spiritual journey. For from it emerge the other gifts of the steps, like faith, acceptance, humility, forgiveness, wisdom, and hope. It's all right here, they say, within and all around, and no moment is too late or too soon to begin the path or begin the path again. The irony of addiction, writes Rabbi Rami Shapiro, is that we thirst for what we already have. We are, as the Zen proverb puts it, looking for the ox while riding on the ox. We thirst for God, for that sense of belonging, completeness, and grace that reveals the fundamental unity of all life within life, when in fact, we are a manifestation of that unity. We are like the fingers of a hand trying to grasp hold of the hand. It can't be done because the hand isn't other than the fingers, though it is greater than them. We imagine that God is other 
and elsewhere. Further, we imagine that when we find God, we will find the magic potion that will give us mastery over ourselves and control over our lives. We confuse God with control and then seek control as a way of proving that God exists and loves us. Why are you standing there looking up at those skies? Loosen the need for control. Redirect your attention, look around you, look within, find acceptance of what is. You are here, we are here, spirit is here. The end, what feels like an end, may just be the very beginning. This week, I stood gazing up at our many stained glass windows in this magnificent sanctuary. I was looking for an image of the ascension, and I found it. Anyone know where it is? In the very center of that rose window above the back organ. There is white Jesus, pictured ascending into glory to be seated at God's side. For a moment, the window had the intended effect, as it should, drawing me into its beauty and wonder. But you know, just then, I remembered Martin Luther King Jr.'s words in his letter from a Birmingham jail, cautioning Southern white ministers arguing for moderation on ending segregation against the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. This was not a loveless critique of the church's signature art, of course, but rather a critically loving calling out of the church's tendency to leave following Jesus at simply becoming nice, church-going people while failing to follow Jesus in the real world, to be concerned with the concerns of the one who came to show mercy and to heal, the one who preached peace and sought out the lost and excluded across boundaries and barriers, to uplift them, reconnect them in community, and remind them that they are seen, accepted, and loved, period. The security of stained glass may lead us to separate the spiritual from the physical, or believe that the spiritual should be unconcerned with the political and the messy, imperfect lives of people. No. Church is where we gather in community to remind ourselves and to be inspired for who we will be not only inside but outside of these walls. It's a weekly rehearsal of sorts, in part a practice and cultivation of joy communal joy, and it is essential. As Jung Wan Kim writes, we will never last individually or collectively if we don't practice the values of the world we yearn for as we struggle and work for that world. Reverend George MacLeod, founder of the contemporary Iona community in Scotland and a warrior for justice, loved to tell the story of a visit to Edinburgh. He was walking, and he saw a massive cathedral with a magnificent front stained glass window, much like ours. But this window was depicting Jesus' birth, the incarnation. And above the manger scene were the words of the angels that night who sang, Glory to God in the Highest. But just then, a young boy ran past George and threw a stone up at that stained glass window, which took out the letter E in the word highest. The heavenly message now read, glory to God in the high street. McLeod said that that boy's actions revealed not only the heart of the story, but also exactly who the church was to be. A movement that doesn't hide behind its four walls or four-ish walls, but that goes out into the high streets of our world with the good news that God is already there, with and within all and for all 
in love. The ascension, I think, is an invitation to get our heads out of the clouds and get even more down to the earth for the love of the earth, to get into the world for the love of the world. Its invitation comes in Jesus' parting words. The Spirit will be your power in my absence, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. To first century Palestinian Jews, Jesus has just asked them to be signs of universal love in Judea, that is, to kinfolk and neighbors, in Samaria, to their ancient enemies, and to the ends of the earth. To strangers. And it reminds me of Valerie Kaur's words on what she called revolutionary love. Loving only ourselves is escapism. Loving only our opponents is self loathing. Loving only others is ineffective. Love calls for all three. Sadly, when Christianity became its own religion and after a few centuries aligned itself with the power of the Roman Empire, it turned a radical course on love and liberation into a colonizing enterprise of dominance and devastation. Loving people by telling them how wrong or inferior they were, that the deepest parts of them were sinful and needed converting. I do wonder if they had held fast to Jesus' way, not only carrying the message of love, but expecting to encounter it in others, in deeper, previously unimagined expressions, and finding their own selves changed instead. God can get tiny if we're not careful said patron patron saint of Los Angeles, Father Gregory Boyle. All we're asked to do is to be in the world who the divine is. Certainly, compassion was the wallpaper of Jesus' soul, the contour of his heart. I heard someone say once, just assume the answer to every question is compassion. We need it in a time when our minds are primed to see the world in terms of us and them, writes Valerie Kaur. We can't help it. The moment we look upon another's face, our minds discern in an instant whether or not they are one of us, part of our family or community or country or one of them. This happens even before conscious thought. Our bodies release hormones that prime us to trust and listen to those we see as part of us and to fear and resent them. It is easier to feel empathy and compassion for one of us, much harder for one of them. When one of us does something bad, we attribute it to circumstance. But when one of them does the same, we attribute it to essence. Oh, that's just how they are. We think of us as complex and multidimensional. We think of them as simple and one-dimensional. And we are much more likely to intervene when we already see a victim of violence as part of us. But we tend to stand by when people we see as them are harmed, whether by policies of the state or violence on the street. In other words, who we see as one of us determines who we let inside our circle of care and concern. The most powerful forces shaping who we see as us and them are the dominant stories in our social landscape. They are produced by ideologies and theologies that divide the world into good and bad, saved or unsaved, with us or against us. So maybe it's here that we have found the unexpected beginning of a new challenge in these times that feel like the end. In the absence of love, peace, 
justice and understanding. In the absence of concern for the innocent being killed in so many places. And when the church again is aligning itself with the power of the empire so aggressively to wield power. Instead of calling power and holding power to account the latter its original vocation. Perhaps it is precisely the lessons of the ascension we need. At this moment where the world of which we dream is absent and are feeling utterly powerless to stop the persistent attitudes of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, of transphobia and virulent anti-Asian and anti-immigrant rhetoric, we look up and cry, how long? Oh God, how long? But then the ascension says, look back down. Ground yourself again and find within and among us that animating power. The only real power that can overcome because its name is love. How will that magical merger of spirit and the unique particles that make you, you, and us, us, light the world. Why are we sitting here looking up at these skies? The journey into wholeness awaits us all. Amen. <laughs>